Hello everyone, I think we're gonna get started now. Um, I, I'm Charlie Noyes, I'm a partner at Paradigm. We're a fun, crypto-focused fund. Um, I mostly work on the venture side, spend a lot of time um, looking at crypto economic systems from the perspective of um, an investor and one of the largest participants in these markets. Um, and I'll be your session chair today for crypto economics in practice. Um, Cool, so I'm gonna be talking about something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, and this is what it means to design an economically efficient protocol, specifically um, those that fall under like the decentralized finance category. Um, generally, this would be protocols that look a lot like the kinds of products you would buy in traditional finance replicated um, here. Um, so the current state of DeFi, um, actually, can I just get a quick show of hands how many people have heard the word DeFi before? Or essentially, all right, perfect. Um, all right, tons of products created. Every hackathon, we see like 100 new forms of DAI. Um, but it's not really clear um, what should actually be possible to create um, and of what is possible to create, um, what the fundamental nature of any of these products are. And when I say fundamental nature, I mean um, it's sort of unclear, I think, to most people in the industry, um, like what a maker CDP actually is, um, what DAI actually is, what a Uniswap LP share actually is, what a position in a compound money market actually is. Um, these are not like well-characterized products, um, and that's gonna make it very difficult to, it, it makes it in general very difficult to talk about them, um, especially with, um, yeah, those that are building second order products at this point on top of them. Um, so mostly I'm gonna be talking about the second issue today. Um, and the case study here is gonna be Uniswap. So can I also get a show of hands for how many people have heard of Uniswap? Okay, excellent. Um, Uniswap's a constant product market, uh, is a decentralized exchange built on top of the constant product market scoring rule. So rather than there being an order book, um, people generally contribute liquidity into um, different pools for different trading pairs. And as a trader, I, um, rather than um, hitting a market maker's quote, just trade against basically this, this market scoring rule, which gives me a marginal price um, for any size. Um, so to just look, walk through like a quick numerical example here, say that we're in the DAI ETH pool, um, and there is currently, let's see if I can get, there we go. Um, all right, so this formula is x, x times y equals k is the market scoring rule. So we have a constant product of 100 million, um, and then these would be the marginal prices um, for a certain amount of ETH purchased. So we start with 1,000 ETH in the pool. Um, I can purchase up to all of that ETH at, um, yeah, a marginal price that goes to infinity as I take the entire pool. Um, so very cool. Um, now, from the perspective of someone that's actually putting the liquidity into this pool, um, the people that have deposited the Ether and DAI into it, um, you're getting a really terrible deal because you're actually going to lose um, no matter what, basically. Um, the idea behind this being that um, as a liquidity provider, you're basically getting a constantly rebalanced portfolio between um, the two assets that you contributed. So for any marginal price change, um, you will lose more. Um, or rather, you will have a lower return than if you were to have just held the assets. You get the geometric mean of the return rather than the arithmetic mean um, if, if you were to have just held them. So um, this is starting at an initial price of one, um, and then for some final price, you're going to have lost no matter what. So bad position. Um, yeah, it becomes pretty obvious. I, so, I'm kind of surprised no one's written about this before, but yeah, it's literally just as a Uniswap liquidity provider, you're realizing the geometric mean um, return for any given price change. Um, okay, so on top of this, we layer trading fees. Um, we wouldn't expect any rational actor to, to contribute liquidity to these markets when you, like, you're just gonna lose no matter what. Um, so we add a trading fee. Um, and basically what happens is that these trading fees compound over time um, and you get, yeah, you're, you're gonna get like some rate of return here um, rather than just um, having lost relative to holding. Um, so a bunch of people in the community have looked at this. These are 
um, rather than just that like simple loss formula, um, varying fees with a fixed amount of trading volume or varying volumes with a fixed amount of fees. Um, and you can see that for some price changes um, and a certain amount of trading volume for a given fee, you actually net out positively. So you'll have a positive, um, a positive rate of return relative to if you had just held the, the assets um, for non-zero price changes, which is cool. Um, and a bunch of people in the community look at this, there are like, uh, I want to say 10 or 12 different websites that are basically just visualizations of like liquidity provider returns in Uniswap right now. Um, but um, like we're kind of just eyeballing it. So from, from the perspective of someone who, from the perspective of someone who's a large participant in these markets, this is um, like not great. You're trying to talk about this stuff, you're kind of just, you're kind of just eyeballing, like, does this feel like I'm being properly compensated for the risk I'm taking? Um, and so the fee initially was chosen, a 30 bit trading fee was initially chosen. Um, I think Vitalik and Hayden like eyeballed this back in 2017, um, unclear why. Um, although it is actually a pretty decent choice. They got, they, they got, I don't know, maybe they didn't know what they were doing. Um, <clears throat> so in thinking about how you could um, like more analytically try and characterize this, um, you pretty quickly get into an area, um, an area of mathematical finance that's like quite common um, for anyone that's familiar with traditional derivatives or structured products called arbitrage free pricing. So the idea here is just that for, for any given financial product, financial asset, um, if you can construct um, an equivalent product, you have a way of pricing a potentially more complicated one. So like obviously the law of one price here being all Apple shares are worth like the same amount, um, like there should only be one price for a given asset. But more than that, if you can construct an equivalent synthetic asset, even a hypothetical or imaginary one, you can come up with potentially a price for one that you can't um, like directly analyze. And Uniswap, for a number of reasons, is quite difficult to directly analyze. Um, <clears throat> so basically what we're doing here is replicating um, Uniswap liquidity provider positions with hypothetical portfolios of options and bonds. Um, so this is actually quite simple. This is basically just a, like the Taylor approximation for finance um, is like one way of thinking about this. Basically, that for any for any given asset or derivative with a twice differentiable payoff, um, you, regardless of what it is, um, this could be like a variant swap, um, Uniswap LP position. It doesn't really matter. Um, that you can replicate it with a hypothetical infinitesimal portfolio of options. Um, so this is what we did. Um, working through the math, um, you get through a bunch of like nasty Black, Black Scholes math, and leaving aside some practical stuff. Um, basically assuming no risk-free rate and making a couple of other um, just like helpful assumptions for the purposes for the purposes of actually getting an analytic answer here. Um, instead of solving this numerically, we pop out that the compound, um, the efficient or like no arbitrage um, compound fee rate of return for Uniswap liquidity provider um, is the volatility of the pair squared over eight, which is quite cool. Um, you can take this and pull out a bunch of different intuitions um, around like the equilibrium behavior of Uniswap pools. Um, it gives you a way to actually answer the question, like, am I being properly compensated for the risk I'm taking if you want to actually put money into this stuff? Um, and more than that, it gives, um, we find it quite interesting because there's never really been an example before in traditional finance where the, you are able to design a product that parameterizes itself. Um, so one idea that pops out of this is um, it's you can basically have in Uniswap the fee set such that you know over some um, like weighted moving average or whatever um, it dynamically retargets the fee constant depending on its deviation from the efficient rate of return um, and so over time you can have in some sense like an efficiently self-parameterizing protocol. Um, which is quite cool. This is not really something you ever could have done before. Um, and then beyond that, you, you do get some other, some other like more interesting intuitions that are kind of um, like less practically useful for, for protocol design or considering it from the perspective of an investor. But um, 
like ways of so ways of showing um, isomorphism to to other products um, on top of Ethereum right now and and things like that. Um, <clears throat> you can take the same approach with a lot of different stuff. Um, Uniswap is actually quite nice. It's like very simple. This is um, th this is not like a complicated um, replication. So um, you know caveat that, but you can take in general the same approach to a lot of different products in DeFi. So like I had mentioned earlier, compound money markets, MakerDAO CDPs, um, like theoretically you could even take balancer or token sets and do like option replication on chain. Um, it's quite interesting stuff. Um, yeah, but the eventual goal of this would be that all protocols are designed or at least analyzed in such a way that um, we can talk about um, we can talk about different pro different uh, products in the abstract um, rather than it's I think I think quite difficult to talk about sort of like what the for example interest rate equilibrium between MakerDAO and Compound should be long term right now um, and most of like the analysis that's been done on this is. Um, like largely heuristic in the same way that right now for Uniswap, you have a bunch of people looking at different charts and graphs um, of like what their returns will actually be as liquidity providers rather than um, having sort of like an objective or concrete notion of, of you know, like what you're actually getting out of this thing. Um, <clears throat> and then eventually um, it would be quite nice if we could test sort of how close to a no arbitrage equilibrium we can actually get in crypto today. So um, like given how good we are at designing these products and the practical constraints we're operating under, um, I think one of the biggest open questions about DeFi in general um, is whether these markets can actually get more efficient um, than traditional ones. So like self-parameterizing protocols, um, an interesting way of, um, of potentially getting to eke out sort of like more efficiency, potentially lower transaction costs eventually. Um, and like all caveated against in practice today, um, yeah, like gas auction dynamics are going to matter more than this um, in terms of protocol design. So um, there's still a bunch of practical stuff that gets in the way of this being like a very nice, um, you know, immediately implemented theoretical result. But like in general, we think that this is probably more of the direction that um, DeFi product design and analysis will go than, than um, what we've been doing so far. Um, and then follow up to this, um, basically, yeah, we have a paper coming out probably sometime in the next six months on um, replicating a number of different products in DeFi um, and suggesting different um, protocol parameterizations or potential mechanism designs like constantly retargeted fees um, for things like Compound and Maker. So, yeah, uh, that's it. If anyone has questions, feel free. Uh, we have question for uh, time for one question. Yeah. Um, so you at the the very it's, my question is about the almost the very last thing in your in your presentation, which is um, you said the caveat is there's all these other practical factors, and um, my I'm trying to like figure out how to formulate this question very concisely. Um, isn't the utility of the underlying asset one of those things that falls under the caveat? Like, like, uh, let's imagine hypothetically in some wild world that people actually used ether to uh, do computation. Then wouldn't that feature like strongly dominate over all of these considerations? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think. There's probably two questions in there. One would be, what's the fundamental value of Ether? Um, which is certainly not something I want to get into now. Um, uh, but two would, would be, does uh, Ether's value actually matter for this? No. Um, actually, the only thing that would matter is if you assume that Ether has zero value. So you could say, like, it implies no. Um, like, if you want to be really pedantic, you could say that Ether, Ether doesn't imply any access to, like, future cash flows or only in terms of itself, so it should be, like, a valueless asset. 
I'm not making that argument, but basically the only way that this analysis doesn't work is that is if you assume Ether or whatever else you're considering um, as the assets underlying these pools are literally worth nothing, in which case, like, not, like none of this really matters. Um, it would sort of be like I... Uh, yeah, it would be like trying to sell you an option on nothing, which, like, doesn't really make sense. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you.